Deformation of a single crystal lattice. The structure of metals usually consists of many individual grains. The individual grains are also called crystallites and are separated from each other by structureless regions. In the micrograph, the structure becomes visible under the microscope. Although the individual grains have the same lattice structure, this is spatially oriented differently from grain to grain. The grainy microstructure is formed during the solidification of metals. The melt begins to crystallize at many points simultaneously. At each crystallization point, the lattice structure is oriented differently. After solidification, the individual grains join together to form the grain boundaries. With great technical effort, however, it is also possible for the melt to crystallize from a single point. In this case, the material has a uniform lattice orientation at the atomic level. It ultimately consists of only a single grain or crystal. Such a material is therefore also called a single crystal. A single crystal therefore also has no grain boundaries. If such a single crystal is deformed under tensile stress, oblique rings are formed in the deformation area if the crystal is oriented accordingly. These rings are so-called slip steps which have emerged from the surface. Further information on the actual deformation process of metals can be found in the linked video. If we take a closer look at the ring-shaped slip steps, they are preferably oriented at an angle of 45 degrees to the tensile axis. Why this is the case and what conditions must be met for this to be the case will be explained in the following. For this purpose, we look at the illustrated tensile test specimen. The single crystal is loaded with the tensile force F0. In order to initiate the deformation process and enable shearing of the atomic planes, a shear force parallel to the slip planes must act inside the material. Only in this way can the planes actually be displaced in slip direction. A force perpendicular to the slip planes, on the other hand, has no influence on the deformation. The planes would only be compressed, but not moved. If a slip plane lies at an angle alpha to the tensile axis, the external force F0 can be decomposed into a component parallel to the slip plane and a component perpendicular to the slip plane. The shear force and the normal force can be determined as a function of the angle alpha as shown. If the angle alpha is relatively large, that is close to 90 degrees, the shear force in the slip plane is relatively low. The force may not be great enough to activate the slip plane and initiate the deformation process. If, on the other hand, the slip plane lies at a relatively small angle alpha, the shear force in the slip plane is relatively large, but at the same time, the area of the slip plane increases and with it the number of bonds between the planes. In this case, too, the greater shear force may not be sufficient to break the many bonds and cause the plane to shear. Thus, there must be a favorable ratio between force and area to achieve the optimum condition where the greatest force per area occurs. The decisive factor for the sliding of the atomic planes is therefore not the force in the slip plane alone, but the force acting per unit area, which is the shear stress. The area of the slip plane is determined as shown using the cross-section A0 of the sample and the angle alpha. The diagram schematically shows the increase in shear force and area with decreasing angle. In addition, the resulting course of the shear stress is shown. It is clear that the greatest force per unit area and thus the greatest shear stress occurs at an angle of 45 degrees to the tensile axis. We will also show this mathematically in the following. To do this, we express the shear stress using the derived formula for the shear force and the area. In this way, we obtain the given formula for the shear stress. In this equation, the quotient of force F0 and cross-sectional area A0 corresponds to the externally applied normal stress sigma 0. The shear stress acting inside the material can thus be determined as indicated from the externally applied normal stress sigma 0 and the angle alpha considered. Furthermore, it can be used that the product of cosine alpha and sine alpha can be replaced by the term marked in red. Thus, for the effective shear stress tau in a slip plane oriented at the angle alpha to the tensile axis, the given equation is valid. The shear stress therefore depends on the applied external stress sigma zero and, in particular, on the angle alpha considered. The term sine 2 alpha reaches the maximum value of 1 for an angle of 45 degrees. 
It can now also be seen mathematically that the maximum shear stress tau max is thus reached at an angle alpha of 45 degrees. In this case, the maximum shear stress is exactly half the external normal stress. For precisely this reason, the copper single crystal shown has slipped steps at an angle of about 45 degrees to the tensile axis. The condition for this is that the lattice structure is spatially oriented in such a way that a slip plane results at an angle of 45 degrees if possible. In the following, the effects on the deformation process are discussed if the slip plane is not at an angle of 45 degrees. Due to the unfavorable orientation, larger external normal stresses are required in this case so that the critical resolved shear stress is exceeded in the slip plane and especially in slip direction. If the orientation of the main slip planes is very unfavorable, this can even lead to the activation of additional slip planes that would normally only be activated at higher stresses, since the critical shear stress is first exceeded in these planes. Gliding can also occur in several different slip systems. This is the case when the different slip planes are symmetrical to the tensile axis. The critical shear stress is then reached in all of them simultaneously. In face-centered cubic single crystals, the unit cells must be oriented parallel to the tensile axis. The colored areas of the unit cell show the symmetrically arranged main slip planes. Since slipping in this case takes place in several different slip planes, it is also referred to as multiple gliding. In this case, the crystal is deformed in different directions. The slip planes emerge from the material surface at different angles and in different spatial directions. The superposition of these slip steps makes it impossible to distinguish the individual steps from each other. They are therefore not visible to the naked eye. In the copper single crystal shown, on the other hand, the face-centered cubic crystal lattice has been deliberately aligned with the tensile axis, so that only one slip plane is oriented at an angle of about 45 degrees to the tensile axis. The animation shows the orientation required for a face-centered cubic lattice. It can be seen that only the blue slip plane is at an angle of about 45 degrees. The other main slip planes are oriented either too steeply or too flatly. As a result, only the favorably oriented slip plane is activated when the critical stress is reached, while the shear stresses in the other slip planes remain below the critical shear stress. Since in this case sliding takes place in only one slip system, this process is also referred to as single gliding or easy gliding. The stress that must be applied externally to a material in order to exceed the critical resolved shear stress in a favorably oriented slip plane is also called yield strength or elastic limit. This characteristic value thus refers to the external limit stress above which an irreversible deformation process begins in a material. As explained, this yield strength for single crystals depends on the spatial orientation of the lattice. The lowest value of the yield strength therefore results for single crystals when their slip planes run at an angle of 45 degrees to the tensile axis. With this understanding, the lattice structure of a single crystal can now also be specifically aligned in such a way that the slip planes are positioned as unfavorably as possible to the tensile axis, thus making sliding more difficult. This is used, for example, in the manufacture of single crystal turbine blades based on nickel. If the blades are loaded in the axial direction, as is the case due to the enormous centrifugal force at high speeds, this makes the material extremely strong. The ring-shaped formation of the slip steps at an angle of 45 degrees therefore only occurs in specially oriented single crystals. However, single crystals can only be produced at great technical expense. They therefore remain limited to special applications such as the aforementioned production of single crystal turbine blades or silicon chips. With silicon chips, however, the focus is not on strength but on the purity of the lattice structure for the highest possible electrical conductivity. Conventional metals usually do not have a uniform lattice orientation due to the solidification process. Because of the large number of grains in the microstructure, one speaks of a polycrystalline material in contrast to a single crystal. Due to the differently oriented lattice structure, several different slip systems are always activated in polycrystalline materials. This means that these materials always show multiple gliding. As a result, the slip steps do not emerge uniformly from the material surface. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it helpful. Thanks for watching.